Actress Felicity Huffman pled guilty to conspiracy and mail fraud charges in a Boston court today for paying $15,000 to an SAT official to raise her daughter's score to the tune of 400 points. She's among 50 people, including 33 parents, who were charged back in March in a massive college admissions conspiracy involving some of the country's most prestigious schools and more than $25 million in bribes. And as for the prosecutor behind the case, U.S. Attorney from Massachusetts, Andrew Lelling, the stakes are high. These parents are a catalog of wealth and privilege. For every student admitted through fraud, an honest, genuinely talented student was rejected. But since the charges were first filed, attention has shifted beyond the fraudulent methods of getting kids into college to the more traditional approach, such as a generous donation to your school or university of choice, underscoring the pressure so many kids and their families put on themselves to attend elite schools like the Harvards and MITs. My next guest was the head of one of these institutions. As the first female president of MIT, Susan Hockfield oversaw the university's most successful period of fundraising. And as the first president with a background in life sciences, she established the David H. Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research and encourage work that cross disciplines, a central theme in her new book, The Age of Living Machines, How Biology Will Build the Next Technology Revolution. Susan Hotfield joins me now. It's so good to meet you. Thanks well, for being here. It's a privilege to be here. Thanks, Jim. Uh, John Landau once said, I've seen the future of rock and roll and is Bruce Springsteen. You appear to say, I've seen the future of everything and they are living oh. machines. What is a living machine? So the future of technology. So a living machine is a machine that's built with biological parts. We can do that because we now have a biology parts list from the magnificent discoveries in biology around the turn of the 20th century. You know, the real transformations of the 20th century came from the electronics, computer, and information industries. But they were made possible because physicists had decoded the parts list of the physical world Engineers picked up those parts and turned them into radios and televisions. Got us to the moon. Dude. Got There's us to the moon and yeah. back. So yeah. you call that Convergence 1.0. The new convergence that you say is, well, we're going to look back on the 21st century as the thing is this biology engineering convergence. And it's not just pipe dream stuff. There's so many great stories to pull from. I hope I got his name right. Is it Peter Agi? Agri? Agre. Agre. Peter My apologies. Agre. No, okay. Tell the story of him in this water channel thing. It is surreal. It's a remarkable story yeah. because Peter Agre is a hematologist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to understand what the Rh protein is. It's a protein on red blood cells that if you can't control it, a mother's antibodies against a baby's Rh protein, that may be different from our own, could really damage the baby, even kill it. Mm -hmm. We now know how to manage that disease, but we didn't know what the Rh protein was. So he went in pursuit. He purified a bunch of red blood cells, you know, got the proteins out of them, purified the proteins, and ended up with a protein band that he was sure was the right thing. He made some antibodies to it. It was wrong. It wasn't the Rh protein. So he was faced with the dilemma. Should he go back and start again and, you know, repurify? But something about this new protein intrigued him. He had no idea what it was. Well, it ended up, at the end of a lot of experimenting, it was a protein that everyone thought didn't exist. It's called a water channel. So all of our cells very carefully regulate the water that comes into them and leaves them. And they do so through a protein that's like a little barrel, but the barrel only will allow water to pass. And while people had looked for it for decades, this water protein, couldn't find it, and they said, oh, it's by diffusion. Water just crosses the membrane without its own little uh, channel. And so Peter Agri had to decide whether he would pursue a protein that everyone believed didn't exist or whether he would go back to square one and get the Rh protein. It ends up. It was the water channel. He won the Nobel Prize. And he fine. And so the Nobel Prize is a nice thing to get. But it, the reason it matters to people like me is because it's potential application on something like water purification. You mentioned your book, only 5% of the water in the world, I think roughly you said, is potable. What, is, what might we be able to do as a result of that discovery? So we've been having to purify water for a long time, for thousands of years. We don't have enough fresh mm -hmm. water. And so from you know, ancient Egypt, there are drawings of people using uh, filtration systems or distillation. But the methods we have are really not good enough. They're inefficient. They're slow. And so a wonderful entrepreneur uh, discovered Peter's papers and said, huh, that's so interesting. Look at this water channel. Only passes water. I wonder if we could build a water filter out of it. 
How do people have these marvelous ideas? I don't know. In any case, so he started a company called Aquaporin AS. It's outside Copenhagen. And they're building water filters that use this protein in them. So this is a machine that is has biology inside. And, and you tell other stories. This Angela Belcher woman who is going to convert, uh, convert may be the wrong verb, but essentially a virus becomes a, a, a battery. And the significance yeah. of that is there's not all that toxic byproduct stuff. Are you at the stage of your life and career where you can still get excited? But when I'm reading these <laughs> things, and I, I am science phobic, as I told you when I met you a few minutes ago. I was so excited when I read about that. Do you still feel that when you hear for the first time about these kinds of things? Oh, absolutely. And the reason I wrote the book is this glimpse of the future is so exciting and I think it should be comprehensible. I want everyone to be excited about these things. But I can tell you when you're the president of MIT, <laughs> you see the most extraordinary future. You can look out over the frontier of discovery and innovation. I describe walking out into the hallway and stopping anyone and I'd stop you and say, Jim, what are you working on? And you'd tell me something. My mouth would drop open I'm so and glad I to would hear that. find myself in a future I had not yet imagined. You know, I'm reading the book, and I felt mm. I'm not an optimistic kind of mm. person. I'm sort of a, a glass or a pipette, totally empty, <laughs> not just part empty kind of thing. Mm. But it, 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 And when I read this, I, I was really upbeat, and then I thought, but there's so many obstacles. How does this happen in an era when we have a president who doesn't believe in science? What did it take him, 19 months to even pick a science advisor? How mm. can anything like this prosper? Well, that's one of the reasons for writing the book, is it requires so many different par parts to be aligned in order to get the products we need out the end. You know, we're looking at a population of over 9.7 billion by 2050. We're not going to get there without war or epidemics or, you know, starvation if we don't develop technologies that will allow us to provide for energy, food, water, health and health care sustainably. Well, that battery that we talked about a minute ago is one of the solutions. Absolutely. Potent. But, but yeah. how, how, you know, it's not just things like being anti-science. It's also anti-immigrant. Mm -hmm. The number of H-1B visas that are available to foreign mm -hmm. experts in areas where there's need here, they're temporary, has obviously been reduced and they're denied in far greater numbers. How do we circumvent these obstacles? Do we? Can we? Well, we have to rely on Congress, you know, to actually support what they always have. So even when any president has delivered a budget that underspends for the kind of research that lies at the foundation of any of these new technologies, Congress has not gone along with it, has increased it. So Congress has been generous, but in my view, we're underinvesting in the foundational elements of the of the technology future. Can we spend one more minute on climate change? We spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on the radio uh, despairing about mm -hmm. the uh, pace of the climate disruption and our, the slow pace of our trying to catch up. And I was reading the final pages of your book, and it, I know this may be obvious. You described that there's a possibility of something that captures carbon dioxide from the air and turns in useful products. So. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be unduly optimistic, but it's conceivable that right around the corner there's a living machine that totally transforms the way we deal with climate change and totally changes that we may catch up as the bottom line. Is that a fair uh, statement that, or no? That, that, that's not only a fair statement, it's a true statement. So like every other epoch in human history where we face the same problem, on, in good ep epochs, technology has given us a route out. So when I think about climate change and the challenge of actually moving to alternative energies, you can't do alternative energies, most of them, without better storage. Mm -hmm. Our battery technology isn't yet sustainable. And that's where that virus comes in. And that's in. where that virus comes in. It's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, before you go, I, I mm -hmm. mentioned the Felicity Huffman plea. Mm -hmm. When you first read about the uh, uh, college admission scandal with Andrew Lelling, what was your reaction as a woman who ran one of the most elite universities in the country? And uh, by the way, yeah. MIT was not implicated, we should make clear, but what was your yeah. reaction? So let me just say why M MIT wasn't implicated and why um, I had a particular perspective on this. MIT demands of every student that they pass our core curriculum which are science courses, sex very hard science courses, so we can't admit students who can't do the work. So MIT doesn't admit legacies. We just you know, have to be very careful about who we bring to campus. It would be unfair to them. Does that include if a wealthy donor says, I'll give you X million dollars, and you've never, you never admitted somebody who was underqualified because of that? We gift? can't do that. You didn't we do can't it. do that, no. Do you no. worry about the future, how people not of means will perceive access to higher education because of what we've learned in the last couple of I, years? I, you know, I think this is the most uh, corrosive 
discovery or revelation about higher education, and it breaks my heart because I think higher education, education from the beginning through, from you know, K through graduate school, is the route to success. And particularly at a place like MIT, a pursuit of engineering and science is a pursuit for obviously people who love it, but also for people who are going to get there based on their own brain, not based on who they know, but based on what they know. And it worries me that the whole college enterprise is being, uh, confidence is eroded because it's not clear mm -hmm. what we're measuring when we admit students. Susan Hargrove, it's a pleasure to meet you. And by the way, I have to be honest, I'm so proud that I was able to read the whole book. I'm proud of it. you too. Uh, thank but, you but so But the book much. is for, for, it was designed exactly for, for like you. For people like me? Exactly well, for you. Thanks so much. The book again is The Age of Living Machines, How Biology Will Build the Next Technology Revolution.